being recorded. Okay. Thank you. So let's uh, let's get started with the the introduction uh, to the material. Let me scroll down here. Again, this file should be available to you on um, on the Bridging Nations website. So I think we're look, we're going to basically look at a couple of things. That, you know, reasons why we're interested in green buildings. What's the whole point of, of doing uh, a green building or a sustainable building? So really coming back to some of the basic environmental issues that we're dealing with, energy issues, uh, and how is a building or making a building different going to solve or, or help any of those issues. So this is really an effort to give some background, and then we'll go into an introduction and really kind of an overview of uh, basically what it takes to uh, to make a green building, uh, what are the concerns that uh, that we have, and, and uh, how are we approaching the overall kind of uh, topic of, of sustainable buildings? So here we have our, our first slide: uh, Why study uh, sustainable buildings? And I said here, energy, energy, energy. Uh, there's an old saying in, in the real estate business. Uh, you know, what's it? What's the most important thing in, in real estate and in picking a building or a house or an office? And they say location, location, location. Um, but I think here it's it's really energy is is the thing that's driving a lot of this. Uh, and I would argue that uh, some of the environmental concerns and water concerns, health concerns, are not uh, I wouldn't say secondary, but they're probably a little more of of less of a concern than energy. Um, and this graph here, and the and the bullet points that I'm giving you here, um, the Department of Energy has the Energy Information Administration (EIA), and they put together the statistics on how we use energy. Uh, and a classic. Let's see. Let's just see if I can zoom in a little bit. I think I can. Yeah, that a little better for us to see. How about that? There we go. Not too bad. The, uh, the, de the Department of Energy categorizes our energy use in the United States into these four broad categories. Uh, residential, get my arrow back here. Uh, residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation. And according to the way they keep the statistics, this should add up to the total amount of energy that the United States consumes. I have some some issues about this and how they include uh, government, for example, or the military in, in some of these statistics. It's not clear when you dive into the to the details on how they do that and how it's covered. Uh, I think some of the government shows up in commercial buildings, uh, military. It's not really clear as uh, what's going on there. But you can see here it's it's fairly well split. You know, almost uh, not quite evenly, but. Each one of these four categories has a has a big uh, big piece of the pie, and if you add the two residential and, and commercial together, uh, 18 and 22, that's going to give you the 40 percent that I've highlighted over here. Uh, so 40 percent of the total consumption of energy in the United States is due uh, to what's being used in, in buildings, and. Uh, we could break that out even further, and, and how's it being used in residential, and how's it being used in commercial? And the, if we do it that way, uh, I've done an analysis of my my own based on the statistics that the DOE provides. Uh, you kind of have to get in and, and play around with their numbers and add things up or s split them out. And nine percent of the total, so nine percent of this total pie here is uh, is going for space heating. So basically, just keeping a building warm in the uh, the heating season, which would be uh, you know the t this time of year, uh, late fall, winter, early spring. So an amazing amount of, of energy is just dedicated to keeping the climate, the indoor climate of our, our buildings, uh, at a comfortable level. Uh, so I think there's a lot of potential, you know, room for improvement. Nine percent um, out of all the categories in this this is in this in total. Total pie. If you break out transportation into a few other a few other categories like personal vehicles, um, that sums up to be the largest um, 
use of our energy. It's about 20%, 19 or 20% of just of our total primary energy is going into transportation for personal vehicles. That doesn't include public buses or aircraft, um, boating, anything else that would use fuels, trucking. Uh, that's all above and beyond. So that out of 28%, almost uh, about 20 of it is for, for transportation. So you can see that the buildings are, are responsible for a lot. Lighting is, is the second largest category, and if you add the residential and the commercial together, 7%. Uh, so you're adding these two together, 9%, 7%. Now you're 16%. You go in and you add hot water, another 4%. So now you're at 20%. So over half of the total uh, of the 40% of energy for residential commercial is being used a, um, being used by buildings. Okay, let's try this out. Now, Zach has raised his hand. Let me see if I can call on him. Okay, I'm going to approve you, Zach. And let's see. I should be able to give Zach the ability to speak. Let's see. Professor Tilly? Yes, Zach. Uh, of this percentage, uh, how... Zach, you should now have the ability to speak with us. Go ahead. How much breaks down for uh, air conditioning and cooling? Air conditioning and cooling. I have those statistics on a, on a chart that I've created. I don't have them on the top of my head. Um, but those are definitely the other big categories. Appliances would be the other major. So if you look at these three we have here, space heating, lighting, uh, refrigeration, you can usually break that one out from the, all the other appliances. It's a large category. And then cooling would be the other, uh, the other big category. I could get, I could share that. Uh, this I have a nice little bar graph that I've, uh, that I've used that I'd be happy to share with you. But good, good question. All right, good, good test of the uh, the hand raising also. So I'm going to, I'm going to disable. Do you have another follow up question on that, Zach? Or I'm going to disable your audio. Great. Okay, so. <clears throat> All right, so uh, so no doubt energy is a big story with, with buildings. Um, let's see here. I'm going to try to. Uh, good. So let's move on to the um, the next. Uh, okay, so now just thinking a little more uh, philosophically, there before we were thinking, kind of thinking some uh, you know, some of the nitty gritty details here. Um, Okay, well, I was trying to highlight my my, uh, <clears throat> my diagram. What I'm trying to uh, to emphasize here is that you know really energy, it's not only being used directly in buildings, uh, which we saw in the in the previous graph. You know those is, those are just accounting that forty percent is just accounting for energy that's used um, directly within buildings. Now you have to make a uh, an exception for electricity, and that was accounted for in the previous graph. You know, a lot of the energy that's used to make electricity is wasted as heat. So if we go back to this forty percent here, probably something on the order of ten percent of this out of the forty, or you know, a fourth of the forty to give us the ten percent, is um, is wasted at the electric power plants as as heat that's uh, is dissipated into the environment. Um, so there's there's an idea of of energy being embodied in a lot of the materials that we're using, and it's also energy is embodied in in energy. There's a lot of energy used to create electricity. So if we come up with the idea of an embodied energy, <clears throat> we can look at the total amount of energy of one kind that it takes to make another type of energy, um, and see that we you know if we're just looking at the direct use say at the, at the building level we may be missing a, a large piece of the puzzle in terms of the energy puzzle if we're not looking at the energy that's used off-site uh, you know to make the steel or to make the concrete um, or even to make to make wood uh, into uh, to lumber and, and plywood and the other composites the plastic materials obviously a lot of embodied energy petroleum uh, usually used heavily natural gas used heavily to make a lot of the uh, the plastic type of uh, 
<clears throat> petroleum-based products that we're using in buildings. So those are our, our concern as well in the energy picture. Um, what I wanted to point out here with this diagram was um, is it really takes uh, these different types of energies here. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit more. There we go. <clears throat> so if we have a, um, a production system here that's using energy and it's creating something that's that's useful. So let's say, for example, this was our, uh, um, and say it was a steel manufacturing plant producing steel I beams that we're going to use in construction. It takes a lot of uh, different types of resources to make that steel. It's going to take the the iron ore. Where did the iron ore come from? Well, it came from a mineral that was. Um, Produced in different concentrations in, in mineral deposits around the world, and, and uh, <clears throat> from highly concentrated to, to, to lower concentrations. So there's energy that's used uh, by nature to actually make the deposits it, it's, itself. So we have some embodied s solar energy, and here we're also showing the tidal energy and the energy from the the deep heat within the earth itself is emanating out from the earth uh, due to radiogenic uh, decay and uh, as well as some residual heat that was put there when the earth was formed. Those energies are being transformed over you know, millions of years to create these deposits for minerals as well as our non-petroleum fuels like coal and natural gas as well as the petroleum. Uh, and then we have kind of shorter time stored environmental energy say like soil or wood it may take on the order of you know hundreds to thousands of years for for nature to to create um, mineral soils. Maybe take on the orders of, of hundreds of thousands of years to create. But the the organic fraction where we you know do a lot of our agriculture uh, is more close on the order of you know, hundreds to to five hundred years. Um, and then we have the renewable energies flowing through. Of course, sunlight's coming through, and it could be used uh, possibly you know directly. But there's also a, a huge, uh, you know, the whole ge uh, biogeospheric system, meteorological system, geology, the ecology. That's all contained within this um, this transformation here to take a lot of these energies and turn them into to other useful products that we need for uh, <clears throat> producing the steel. And the main one would, here would be water uh, to have fresh water. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to create that fresh water from the oceans and the, and the evaporation from you know lakes and, and the uh, the biology, the plants of the of the land. So there's embodied solar energy that's embodied in all of these flows as we go up through here. Some of them over long periods of geologic time. Some of them over shorter periods of time. And then we get down here to our production process. Some of those are used directly, right? We might be needing use. To use water for cooling our uh, our, our producing steam or, or cooling our steel, so might be using it directly. Um, of course, the steel plant ex exists on land that's being uh, bombarded by uh, solar photons and may or may not be used. It's, it's used to heat the microclimate in the building. Um, you may be using wood, possibly, or some other kinds of materials at the steel plant. Uh, we said about the, mi the minerals, the iron being used. Uh, but then here you get to the fossil fuels, um, the coal, natural gas, and petroleum. <coughs> could be used uh, directly as well. Coal is used, or and charcoal is used directly a lot. Or coke, the uh, <coughs> concentrated charcoal, could be used directly in the in the process. And and historically, embodied energy analysis is, is very. Good.